Right, welcome everybody to the Fabian Society tonight. Um, um, Mike Smith's my name. I'm a member of the Wellington Committee of the Fabian Organization, and it's uh, good to see uh, so many of you here tonight. We're also um, showing this event on Zoom, and it will be up later on YouTube. Um, tonight's event is titled Beyond Jacinda. Uh, it's based on a paper that Colin James gave to the, or well, several places, Wellington Club most recently, um, and looking at the, uh, well, casting an eye back over the turning points in New Zealand's political history and looking at what might be the shape of our future history. And we've asked Tamitha Paul to respond uh, to the issues raised in uh, Colin's paper because she represents the generation that will have to deal with it, uh, unlike, dare I say it, most of us. Uh, so um, it's great pleasure to welcome both of you tonight. And Colin, thank you for the paper. And now the floor is yours. And then we'll have, after Tamith has responded, we'll have some discussion and debate. Thank you. Give them a round of applause. Please. That should really be afterwards, if warranted. Uh, uh, th thank you, Mike. Um, I I'm not going to go back through too many turning points in history, but um, I'm going to look forward. Uh, and uh, this, if you want to read the whole, if you haven't got a copy of the talk that I did to the Wellington Club on November the 3rd, it's on my website, colinjames.co.nz, and it's number one item. Uh, it's now a little bit out of date because it was November the 3rd before the final election result, but, and I've uh, been working on a slight adaptation, but I, that's not available tonight. So. Um, the Beyond Jacinda, and this is a, uh, I'll only talk very briefly uh, to what I said on the, because it's about 40 minutes what I said to the Wellington Club, who of course are very uh, patient, um, uh, and uh, uh, I'm only going to talk for about 15 minutes, so if you really want to fill in the detail, you'll need to go to that uh, 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 longer version. The Beyond Jacinda title is not a premature suggestion that the Prime Minister is transitory. Jacinda Ardern has demonstrated the requisite skills and resilience to see through this second term and, if she wants, have a fair shot at a third term if there are no big shocks that shatter public confidence in her and her government, such as, for instance, a 40% house price crash. Uh, my instinct always was, from October 2017, when she was sworn in first as Prime Minister, uh, that Labour would get a second term. Jacinda Ardern is a macro personality, that is, she floats above day-to-day -day politics and draws voters into an entrancing aurora. Her handling of COVID-19 demonstrated a mastery of detail, personal strength, firm decision-making, and ability to communicate the decisions and somehow meld the government with the people. We, the government, and you, the people, are one. We are you, you are us. That may have added COVID and her response to it, six to eight percent to Labor's near record, uh, to Labor's likely result. It's 50.01 percent was remarkable, as was National's near record, 19.4. National has a lot of work to do to regain, regain credibility as an alternative government, and I say more about that in, in the talk. Uh, Jacinda Ardern's deft arrangement with the Greens keeps them alongside, but also distinct enough to keep them in Parliament and be a third-term coalition partner. So when I say beyond Jacinda, I am not talking about uh, something after this transitory Prime Minister. I'm talking of the context in which her government operates. Beyond these shores, to the disturbed world outside and beyond this three-year term through what promises to be a turbulent decade of climate, ecosystem and technology forces that will require major policy change. Plus a rising generation with different ideas of how that policy should change, and that's Tamitha. 
In the context of these wide and future challenges, I ask, are Jacinda Ardern and her Generation X and Y contemporaries tiptoe through the tulips types or striders up and over the mountain pass? Yes, they do things differently from their boomer parents, uh, but are they different enough to make a real difference in this different decade? For now, we here in this country are in a little bubble. Pre-COVID, the economy was going reasonably and still is. The two main parties of the last 85 years are still the two main parties, unlike in almost all other liberal democracies. There is not widespread anger at the ruling elites. Extremist and populist parties here operate at the margin. The outside world is turbulent. Global trade stalled after the GFC. Protectionism rose, you know we're from particularly, and the World Trade Organization has been undermined by the United States. But globalization is not dead. Global companies and global supply chains still work. Global finance is alive and invasive. World debt has doubled since uh, 2007. Digital services continue to globalize and carry global connectivity. And while globalization of people had already eased before COVID's attack on travel, the push and pull factors for migration still persist. The global economy and global politics are rebalancing, notably China's assertive rise, and the populism is corroding liberal democracies. COVID is a symptom and agent of that rebalancing. We will find the rules have changed when we try to get back to normal, and we will not it will take us a while to find out what the new rules are. We are coming also to the end of a half millennium dominance by the West of ideas of how to run societies, economies, nations, and the world. And in that rebalancing, redefinition, China is confident and the liberal democracies are not. The economic orthodoxy of the past 40 years is under sustained scrutiny, critique, and criticism in those liberal democracies. Well, navigating this outside world will be challenging, to say the least, as the new Minister of Foreign Affairs is well aware. Our best hope is coalitions of the willing, and New Zealand has been involved in establishing four of those. That's getting like-minded countries together to act together. Then on top of that, there's accelerating climate change, emerging shortages of water and other necessities, over-exploitation of natural resources and more pandemics to come, telling us to change our habits. Add in society-changing technologies like artificial intelligence, which mines massive data and fuels robots, artificial protein and high-rise urban gardens challenging traditional ag agriculture, and gene editing, and much else that I could talk about. At home, the challenges of the 2020s include embedded corrosive inequalities of opportunity, unfinished Treaty of Waitangi adjustments, the changing nature of work and our quarry economy that we're still dependent on, the challenge of our positioning between the West with which we share values and China and Asia on which we're over-dependent economically and whose geographical area we live. Well, to deal with these external, long-term and domestic challenges requires a mentality shift of the sort that drove the radical changes of 1984 to 1992, uh, when, when th those changes were, brought us a deregulated, open, socially divisive economy, an independent nation in policy and, importantly, in creative expression, and a start towards a bicultural nation in a multi-ethnic one, and that biculturalism is the most important legacy of that gov those governments in that period, I think. Helen Clark settled this into a third way, uh, with some collectivist modifications, which Sir John Key and Sir Bill English continued with some individualist 
my modifications. For they were all, those three, of the cohort born from 1942 to 1961. And that cohort's dominance ended in 2017. The X and Y generations made up half the cabinet and most of the key ministers. Winston Peters was a hangover and he is now gone. The XYs are in charge now in parliament and in the cabinet. So, a different generation, different policies. Jacinda Ardern promised a government of transformation. You're probably sick of hearing that phrase. But in the first term, it was formative, not transformative. It was a social repair shop, not an innovative enterprise of deep reform in climate change and the future of work and tax and welfare and so on as I've gone on in the detail of the talk. Helen Clark said, over promise, under promise and over deliver. Jacinda Ardern has over promised and under delivered. Remember her declaration at the beginning of 2019 that that year was to be the year of delivery. Well, a clue to the Ardern Jacinda Ardern Grant Robertson mentality lies in Jacinda Ardern's announcement when dump, dumping capital gains tax that she didn't have a mandate. But mandates don't come from heaven, although Xi Jinping might think so. They are built best by leaders who subscribe to Ashley Bloomfield's description of leadership as an invitation to collective action. By ruling out capital gains tax while she is Labour leader, Jacinda Ardern said in effect she would not try to build a mandate. An excuse or rationale for the lack of transformation was the Winston Peters break. That is gone. But Middle New Zealand is not keen on radical change and Jacinda Ardern and Grant Robertson are keenly aware of that. Jacinda Ardern talked in the early part of her first term of fiscal caution being necessary for her to get a license to govern from the skeptics in Middle New Zealand and from business. But there is, is room for them to flex their policy muscles. It lies in well-being economics, an invention of Mar Amartya Sen via the New Zealand Treasury. Um, and that uh, well-being economics aims to judge how well we're doing, not just by GDP stuff, by, but by environmentally, socially, and human developmental criteria. This is intuitively logical for most people when they stop and think about what they value in life. Very difficult, however, to get hard numbers, but the government could, if it pushed hard, get enough on the board to start to change the political language. That change of language could be promoted by using the word well-being at every opportunity. If there's a road, you say that's for the well-being of the community. If you open some state houses, it is for the well-being of the people who will live in it, and so on and so on. Well, the word has been used a wee bit since the election, but generally over the past six months or so, that word has scarcely been heard from the government despite its adoption of well-being economics in well-being budgets. Jacinda Ardern is focused on child poverty reduction. That basically is a palliative approach. Instead, she could recast it as investment. And you could ask, what is the most important infrastructure investment we can make? To which, in my view, the answer is children. Have I underestimated Jacinda Ardern and Grant Robertson? Well, Jacinda said after the election that the transformation would be incremental. Well, Sir Bill English uh, invented incremental radicalism. Uh, this was the notion that small steps taken over time in a particular direction would result in the end in an outcome that would have been radical if it had been done in the first year. But he had not got there in three terms, and how many terms would Jacinda Ardern's incremental transformation take? Well, the post-XYs, like Tamitha, in my view, are not incremental. And they're restive. Climate strikes, ihumatau, young people on councils, a big increase in the young vote in this year's election. 
And so is Jacinda Ardern, like Norman Kirk in the early 1970s, a pivot between two eras? In some ways, holding on to the established policies, such as the third way, and in others, climate change and well-being, question marks after both of those, anticipating bigger post-XY, the Tamatha generation changes to come. Well, history does not repeat, but properly discounted, it can help us ask questions about what is in front of us. The activists among the post-XYs, those in their teens and 20s, plus a few of the 30 to 35s, seem to be growing, the activists seem to be growing in number and voice. They want major economic, social, and environmental policy change. Their share of the electorate will grow. For a third term, if Jacinda Ardern wants to set up Labour as the usual party of government through the 2020s, she and Labour will need a licence to govern from this younger cohort. Take climate change. For most over 50s, action on climate change is a yes unless matter. Yes, something should be done unless it costs me too much or otherwise disturbs my life too much. For most under 30s, and more particularly for those under 25, it is just a yes, a matter that has to be dealt with, with the urgency growing with every passing half measure. For them, the unless is, unless something is done and quickly, there will be disaster for me and my children. Of course, the post XYs have not invented agitation for action on climate change, and you should expect to step up an action uh, from this government this term. Plenty of over 50s and XYs are on the climate change case. But nor did the 1942-61 cohort invent opposition to sport with South Africa, war and nuclear weapons. Those movements began in the 1950s. But it was when the 1942-61ers populated and then took over those and other movements for change that they developed unstoppable momentum. Similarly, Unless ex-Mormon Jacinda Ardern and ex-Presbyterian Grant Robertson have a Damascene moment, it is the post-XYs who will build that mandate for big change, if there is to be big change, and do note that if. Those beyond Jacinda's are starting in Jacinda Ardern's time, and some XYs are with them, but their time and power is a decade or more away beyond Jacinda. The 1942-61ers were of a mindful big change in the from the 1960s, but then affected it in the 1980s. That, that mentality was the endogenous factor, as it is with the post-XYs, the beyond Jacindas. The 1942-61ers constituted a transformative wave. There was also an exogenous factor, global events and shocks in the lead up to 1984 strained New Zealand's international connections, economy, and society. So too now, as I noted earlier, there is global turbulence and likely shocks. That combination of endogenous and exogenous influences will demand big policy change sometime late in the 2020s or early next decade. Well, don't rule out an Ardern Robertson Damascene moment leading to serious policy change. You never say never in politics, I learned quite a long time ago. But on the evidence so far, don't count on such a moment, even less so for any national led government later this decade. Ruth Richardson apart, radical change does not come easily to nationalists. If there is no Damascene moment, get set for the beyond Jacindas. By comparison with the actual Jacinda bubble of moderacy, by comparison with them, the actual Jacinda bubble of moderacy may be remembered wistfully by the XYs as a time of mildness and hope, as in the 1980s, parents of the 1942-61ers remembered the 1950s. Thank you.
Cool. Cool. Oh, tēnā tātou. Um, uh, tuatahi ngā mihi nui kia koutou katoa. Um, ko ai au he rea hau nō ngā te awa mewai kato tainui hoki. Uh, I te poaki a hau i tokoroa, engari in hoa nga hau ki uh, Aro Valley i ngā ane. Um, ai, ko te amata pō tōku ingoa. Tēnā tātou. Um, so I just introduced myself um, and I thought I'd just spend a, a brief moment introducing myself because I'm aware that there's probably a few people here that don't know who I am or a bit about my background and how that's kind of relevant to this cordial that we've had and some of the things that Colin's talked about. So um, I hail from two iwi, uh, one Ngātiawa, which is along the east coast, um, so the Whakatane area of the North Island, and also Waikato Tainu, so that's obviously um, the central North Island. Um, I didn't grow up here in Wellington, I actually grew up in a place called Tokoroa, which is in the central North Island. Um, it's, a, it's a working class town, it's a, it's a factory town, it's a pulp and paper mill town, um, and I'm the daughter of, my mum's a nurse, um, she does palliative care, um, and my dad's a truck driver, so he's done that all our life, so that's a bit of a background about me. I moved down to Wellington actually to study, so I did a, I did a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and International Relations, ironically. However, I wouldn't say that I'm like Max or Ashbrook level um, theorist or kind of analyst, analyst so I'm, I'm hoping to get all my thoughts out in a fairly um, concise and kind of uh, followable way. Um, but anyway, so I moved down here um, and I, I was the first person in my family go to, to go to university. So when I got there, I sort of saw all of the different barriers that people, just I guess normal people from kind of working class families faced in trying to get to university, whether it was, um, you know, the cost of living, it's now $20,000 for to live in just an accommodation in your first year of university, which your family has to fork up, you can't uh, get that on a student loan, the cost to live in these big cities, um, experiencing different issues like mental health or having experiences of family or sexual violence or other things that we know from evidence are massive reasons why people either don't go to university or don't continue on in university. And so I saw my opportunity at university as a way to bring um, the focus on a lot of those issues and try my hardest to try and bring down those barriers for other people. So I got involved in the student union up at Victoria, um, which is VUSA, the Victoria University of Wellington Students Association. And we did lots of things that I'm really proud of. We were able to um, get the university to acknowledge the prevalence of sexual harm in the student community. One in three students experienced that while, uh, during their time at university. So um, they acknowledged their existence by creating a policy centered around survivors. Um, after years of lobbying them, we were able to get $10 million for our student health counseling services, which um, allowed us to get more counselors so that students didn't have to wait so long to see a counselor. And we did lots of other things. But basically I say that because that was my introduction to the, the power of collective action, but also Wellington, because I was shocked, and it was in my first few weeks of living here, I was walking up the terrace, and there was a protest outside the, I think it was the Ministry of Corrections, because um, it was Judith Collins at the time was putting trans women into men's prisons, and even just seeing the fact that you know, coming from a place like Tokoroa, you don't see people protesting and you don't see the power of collective action. So to see it there and to see how powerful that can be was really transformative to me. Um, and so I decided to get involved. So I did that and then last year, my full-time job was as the student president at Vic. And, um, and I decided I wanted to stand for council because there were many reasons why I wanted to run for council, but I think the biggest one was wanting to be represented around the table, not just as a student, not just as a young person, not just as a Māori, but just to be at that table and be able to bring my community's voice with us because I know that there's so much potential um, within local government, which I want to talk about because I think that local government and especially just localism has a massive role to play in our future, especially when it comes to addressing some of those really big issues that you know, Colin's touched on already, um, 
but I think the key thing for me that I've seen is that these problems look different in different places, so they require local solutions. So that's a little bit about me, um, just to, for that context of what I'm going to talk about. So I think I'm, as a, a, a what is it, Generation XY? Post XY. Post XY. Um, that you can call yourself what you want. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I find it really, I find it a re really interesting because um, I almost, you know, there's the media, and I think a lot of a lot of us just in our day-to-day co -day conversations, we talk about these generational divides. But what I see so much coming through in my generation with with my friends and the conversations that we're having is that we actually want to go back in time, actually rediscovering some of those. I guess going as far back as rediscovering some of those indigenous solutions, but also going back to the days where unions were super strong and I was just learning at the Wellington's Trade Hall recently about this huge protest that happened on uh, Cuba Street back in like the, the 1980s and there was a, a paddock there and like 200 people just having a massive, and I'm like, that's awesome. Like I wish we could go back to the times where we really stood up for those rights um, to that scale. But anyway, so I think it's also, so although there's these generational conversations that we have, I think actually our generation is also looking to the past as well. And I know that a lot of the other young leaders that I know have been raised by their komatua and actually the older people in their lives who have actually given them those invaluable lessons that have allowed us to try our hardest to be leaders or to try and shape what our future will look like. So. Although the generational divide is there and the circumstances are different, I think there's a real importance in those lessons that we can always look back and see. Um, but I do feel that we are on the cusp of something, and I don't know what it is, but um, it just feels like a lot of the big issues in society are coming to a head and that things just can't continue on the way that they are and that soon just something has to give and there's just going to be a massive explosion or renaissance or I don't know what that looks like but I can I can definitely feel it and and I think what it will look like is actually yeah a, re a return to the way the old ways of doing things which again is much more local um, that looks to again those indigenous solutions um, so again Colin you touched on a lot of these issues but the, I guess the issues that I see f that um, my generation will be Dealing with, we're dealing with them today, but I think some of the kind of meteor issues that we will still continue to deal with. Um, I think the biggest ones for, one for me is that in 20 years' time, um, it will be the 200th um, year since um, Te Tiriti o Waitangi was signed, and I think we still haven't quite figured out what that looks like in the practical, in a practical sense. I think people like Pa Moana Jackson, Margaret Mutu, um, all of these really intelligent leaders have, they've given us so much information um, and they've really drawn it out for us and now it's really up to us to act on those, to act on that. You know, I think we could sit here writing and talking about it. We could continue to do that, but I think our generation are really the ones that need to act on that and figure out what that process looks like because in this day and age, it's really messy, um, really hard to distinguish, and I'm sure we'll get into some specific examples of that later. Um, and I think what that, what I see that resulting in is again that real focus on localism. So, I think central government has far too much power and far too much resources, and I actually think some of that needs to be. Do you want pen? No, I've got pen. Oh, cool. um, that some of that needs to be given out, and I think it really needs to be up to local communities to be determining what those solutions look like. Because what works, so I'm responsible for climate change in Wellington. Well, the portfolio. Um, for dealing with it. So and from my perspective, what works here in Wellington doesn't necessarily work out in the region. It doesn't work out in Auckland. It doesn't work even in, in other metro cities. So although central government has a really big role to play in terms of enabling certain things, we actually have to come up to, with those solutions ourselves. And I think having that local focus and having more power and more resources at that level means that we can actually give effect to our role as treaty partners because that will allow us to partner on, a, on much greater levels with local hapu and iwi to be able to determine what those solutions are but also to um, allow them to pursue tino ranga tiratanga um, themselves or their own self-determination. So I think localism has a really big role to play and I 
I don't know how that happens. I really don't see any MP or party advocating for that, but I think that's something that needs to happen, and I'll, I'll, I'll think on that one. Um, I think obviously we've got a climate and ecological emergency in, in front of us, and that's a really big concern for me, particularly the ecological impacts of that climate emergency. Um, I'm, I guess, I think we all we all know about that, but I'm, that, that's something that definitely creates a lot of anxiety for me. Um, just keep going through this list of um, big issues. I think inequality as well. Um, you talked a lot about that. Is, is really, is really. I just don't see how it can can go any further. And actually, if we look locally, I think that kind of is culminating in Tiaro Park because that is constantly in the media because people are constantly talking about the amounts of emergency housing tenants or homeless people or gangs that are in that area. But what I see that is, is the fact that this is a problem that can't just be segregated out to particular parts of New Zealand anymore. It's until we address, until we fully address our collective responsibility to each other as human beings, the issue that we will see on our doorstep will continue to grow and there's no amount of fines or policing or you know punitive measures that will take that away. We actually have to address we actually have to treat people with dignity, and I think that requires giving up some of our own power and resources to address that. Sorry, Mark, and I'm just going on. <laughs> um, so I think inequality, that's obviously another big one. Um, and I think there's some other really, um, there's some other things that will really come to, I guess, come to light um, with the now generation, and probably soon as well, but I'm talking about massive racial issues, um, you know, Black Lives Matter this year obviously has been a massive movement for a long time, but we finally saw it have an impact here and, and see that people are passionate about that as well. Um, March 15th as well, obviously a huge, um, a huge, I guess, disgraceful part of our history. Um, but even things like the Royal Commission into um, Abuse and State Care, all of these things that will come to ahead, I think those are things that we actually have the opportunity to address. So moving back into now, oh well, I mean those are all now issues, but I guess with Parliament and the new makeup, I mean I'm a little bit hopeful with the new, pe I think there's some really good new people in there and not necessarily just those who are in government, so personally I'm really excited about Rawiri Waititi. Um, being in Parliament and also Debbie Ngariwa Packer, I thought her maiden speech was extremely powerful addressing what had happened at Parihaka for the first time in those um, in those halls I guess was was really powerful to see um, and yeah I guess I'm hopeful that there are enough real people in Parliament at the moment to hopefully have some change but then I guess I am also a bit cynical that the kind of um, power within that place may rest in the hands of a few which is disappointing um, yeah, so I guess just to be a bit more positive, I have a lot of hope in the education system, so I think that that can play a really important role at um, looking at some of the cultural attitudes that uphold some of those issues that I talked about and also really instilling that sense of collective responsibility that I think has kind of withered away a bit um, in our society, including in my own generation. I think we do need to be thinking collectively a lot more. I think we can, the education system can be a way that we ensure that people stay connected with the importance of the environment and the repercussions of their actions and what, you know, keep retaining that connection with the environment allows us to not be so wasteful and kind of out of sight, out of mind with our behavior and activity. Um, I'd love to see there be a genuine working people's party because I don't see that in parliament um, and I think there are also some really exciting opportunities of new ways of living and I think that our generation's lifestyles will be pretty inconvenient because I think that's kind of the root of a lot of our problems is that we've been given all of these convenient ways to live um, and that's really been at the detriment of our planet um, but also exploits other people you know um, all of our essential workers um, and all of the people that create that convenience for us, I think we really need to move back into a space of inconvenience um, that will actually probably bring us more in tune with yeah, our own actions, our own choices and our own connection and relationship with our communities and with the environment. So I'll stop there and now we can have a bit of a discussion. But yeah, thank you for listening to my thoughts.
Yeah, it's going. It's going. Is it? It is now. It is now. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Tamitha and Colin. So now, would people like to okay, can, question, can I, can discuss? Can, uh, okay, can, we've got. Can, can, can I just oh, offer a couple of uh, sorry, thoughts Colin, on, on that? Sorry, Colin. Of course. Yeah. Um, two things. One, you talked about reaching back to previous generation. Are you talking about recovering values and then applying the values to the modern conditions uh, rather than just trying to go back to a set of policies that used to be around in the 50s or 60s or 80s or whenever? You're talking about recovering deeper values. Is that what you're talking about? Definitely values, definitely not the policy. Yeah. yeah. No, 100% the values. And yeah. Yeah the, I, yeah, the values that our komatsu and um, yeah. grandparents brought us up on, I think, yeah, is what I was meaning by that, yeah. The, the second thing is localism, which I've puddled around for some time. Um, can I just offer one thought that you might want to comment on? Uh, I, I t tried this idea out of uh, about three or four years ago. You could use uh, digital means for interactive uh, engagement between a council and, and, and the people in, a, say, a precinct or a street or so on, instead of having consultation, which is from on high and people can say what they want, you actually have a real engagement and then you could gradually potentially develop that mechanism for political decision making out of the local precincts into the council as a whole and then perhaps the country. Or is that just too wild? I mean, you're, you're the digital generation. Yeah, and I kind of resent it a bit because I think that um, technology has actually driven us apart quite a lot. Like It's been very helpful this year in order to stay in touch with um, each other during the lockdown and, and, and you know, pe family across the country. But I think the problem with technology is it deprives us of the, I guess, the inherent value of being with other people physically. And I... And I do see that in my own generation and that a lot of people are more comfortable to interact online than they are to go out and it actually creates a lot of social anxiety um, because people aren't used to interacting. So it might, might actually be counterproductive rather than productive. Yeah, I think we thinking? need to go back to being mm. together in real life. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But if people aren't getting together, how, how do you get them together? That's a good question. Well, I think and I've always been able to pull together a crowd when there's a cause that people are passionate oh. about. So I think um, there's that. But I guess it goes back to having to have that culture of collectivism embedded from yeah. the beginning rather than something that kind of like a sprung. And, and just one final point, only one final, small point. Um, does your, do your contemporaries have the energy and determination to make the sort of changes that, are going, that you, you said are, gonna, are going to be necessary? Or are you just layabouts like some of the old farts like me, not me, but uh, farts like me say, you know, this younger generation, you know, they only care about themselves, they don't care about the rest of the world, etc. Well, I think so. <laughs> I think we've, we've defi we definitely do. And I think it's actually out of gratitude for, you know, like I was talking about the work that yeah. um, Moana Jackson and and those people have done in terms of setting out the kind of blueprint for constitutional transformation or honouring Te Tiriti or Waitangi. Yeah, Waitang. but they're the old, they're the old guys. You know, you, yeah, no, I'm, I know, I'm, but out of gratitude for their work, we actually have to act on that, and I think we're really lucky because we don't have to, we don't have to create that knowledge out of anywhere, but we need to actually act on that now. Um, but the ideas thing are on and are getting more powerful. Um, it is. Uh, <laughs> The ideas linger on, well, they don't linger on, they're gaining power, which is their contribution, isn't it, of those uh, the, uh, people like um, Moana and uh, uh, Elizabeth, no. Okay. Questions, oh, right. Over, uh. This microphone around, that would help a lot. Uh, if someone can carry it instead of myself. Thank you. Hi. Tamata, it's really good to finally see you. I noticed you on a candidate's booklet uh, before election, and I was at a protest, the one you mentioned, 
So it's good to see actually work. That's quite a few years back. Which one? The, oh, the, the one you told you told me about. The one you just mentioned. Just when you came to Wellington about the corrections. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think my question being Wellingtonian, I noticed this, and I'm not sure because I don't really know Maori culture that well. I do notice Maori people often. You mentioned the iwi you came from. And because uh, Wellington, there are so many times in the front page about Shirley Bay issue. I'm not sure whether it's a, but that's just one of the issues that I noticed, which is the uh, Maori people between different iwis seem to have different ideas about what's the right way to do things. And uh, how, um, and I, I actually ask a few, in some occasions, I ask a few Maori people about their opinions. They are well educated, got a good jobs, and they all told me they didn't pay attention to that matter. And I was quite surprised. I was like, why? Why don't you care? Oh. And then she said, oh, they, then they said to me, they are not from the iwi, or not from the, I don't know, you know. And uh, I was just wondering, um, when Maori people talking about self-determination, about a lot of the settlement, you know, uh, yeah, uh, tribunal or Waitangi uh, treaty settlement, and when things happen afterwards, they all the ag disagreement between different iwis, is there some kind of a higher power other than say, hey, government, you you be the judge again, because they don't really want that. How do you actually make sure um, the, uh, I don't know, is a consensus or um, who is the is sup superior mm. power to say, hey, yeah. let's do it this way. It's a well, better for all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the, the big thing to acknowledge is that um, first, first of all, iwi, okay, let's just start with any, any organisation or group of people have disagreements and conflicts. We have them way far more often than we do on Wellington City Council. So I think that's like the first thing we have to acknowledge that every group in society have disagree fundamental disagreements with one another. Um, I think that's just a really important thing to acknowledge. But I think the reason that people would have been saying to you that they didn't either didn't pay attention to it or they're not going to have a say on it is because it's not their particular iwi and they don't know what the inner workings of that not talking about Shelley Bay because I've obviously made a decision on that, but with every other iwi's conflicts, I don't get involved with that because that's not my iwi. Just like I wouldn't get involved in another family's drama, I wouldn't get involved in another council's drama because it's, it's just not my business. So that's kind of on that particular question, if, if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? There's dysfunction in every group. Oh, you've got it. Sorry. Does that? Yes, question. Tamatha, you mentioned a workers' party, a workers, a working people's party. Can you explain a little bit about what you were referring to and what you would like to see? Yeah, so I guess, um, and I think there are kind of, sorry Colin, if you want to jump in on this as well, that's all good. Um, I guess um, when I look at and I, yeah, I do think that this is a bit of a systemic issue, but when I look at the parties and the people that are made up, you know, the people that are representing that party, very few of them are workers, like just gen like have just come from a working background. A lot of them are lawyers and have all these really awesome careers and professions, which is great, but it would be awesome to have people who, you know, really had that experience of what it was like to be an essential worker. Because, you know, I look at the conversations that are had in Parliament, they're not relevant or accessible to people like my parents. Um, and so few of the policies are actually genuinely, legitimately kind of uh, aimed at helping out that experience and ensuring that people can work a 40 hour week and have enough money to get by at the end of the week. So I guess that's kind of my perspective there is that, yeah, the representation, but also the policy that comes from that. But again, I think it's hard because you can't just have normal people in these roles because the public service works in a way that you have to really know how to work it. And that's what I've found in council is that it's, you know, that the, the system is not necessarily working on your side. You have to go around every, you have to try, you have to put in so much effort to get just a small payoff from that. So I think that's kind of the systemic barrier to having normal people in there, if that makes sense. If I can follow that through, um, the absence of 
the representation that Timothy is talking about uh, gave us Trump in the United States and uh, a massive conservative majority in the last election in uh, 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 Britain, and it's across Europe as well, the collapse of the centre-left parties. And if you look out, say, five or six years and Jacinda Ardern decides she's had enough or the electorate decides she's had enough, will we be uh, exempt from that sort of reaction uh, from people who are wage workers you know, and not all that well off uh, and without the sort of prospects that my generation had when we were young? Um, and, and I go back to my little comment that we're in a little bubble here you put a pin in a bubble and all the air comes out and that's that's one of the risks that we face and if I can comment just I think what uh, Tamitha said about the importance of collective action is is crucial because that's that's where that power uh, such as it was came from and I, I absolutely take the point the more and more collective actions we take small no, ma no matter how small that, that uh, starts the ball rolling. And if you, if you think about the, the uh, state oh, as the collective agent for us, and then you go back to that Ashley Bloomfield quote that I gave before that real leadership, he didn't say real, he just said leadership is an invitation to collective action, which I think is uh, the best definition of leadership I've heard from anyone. Hi, kia ora. Um, I want to follow up on Colin's point earlier about, um, about whether the young generation has the will and the energy to um, wrest the power from the boomer, m my generation. Um, because uh, your, your, power's, your power's gone already. The X and Ys have taken over well, from you lot. I, 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 I lot. challenge that. Um, I don't think any elites give up their power willingly. And I come back to once when I was in a union and we had a dispute over holidays and I said, well, this is going to have to go to strike and probably for a couple of weeks. And the young people said, oh, a couple of weeks, we can't afford that because we've got uh, student loans and so on. I think if the power's going to be rested, you have to look at your TV screens and look at what's happening in Hong Kong and Thailand and you're going to have to put your careers and your life, uh, livelihoods and uh, lifestyles on the line to actually wrest that power from the boomers. Uh, I, Could you, I, I, would you mind just commenting about, about that, whether you think you have the will to do that? Um, oh, uh, someone gonna get that? <laughs> on, Andre, with the mic down here, so I have a question from down oh, the front. I'll just give a question here first. Oh, okay. Sorry, you're getting so a we have a question from Sean on Zoom, and is there a distinction between the great pause and the great reset? For example, a matter of intent and agenda, or are they one and the same? Mm. That's probably one for you, Colin, the great pause Sorry, and I, the great... I, di I didn't quite get it, actually. Uh, it was, uh, is there a uh, distinction I'm, I'm between the great pause and the great reset? The great what and the great reset? The great reset. And the great pause. Uh, pause, what's that? Uh, <laughs> for example, a matter of intent and agenda, or are they the same, or? Uh, what's the great uh, I don't know what the great pause is, I'm sorry. The, the great reset is. Wars. Oh, the great, the great. Uh, uh, okay, uh, my understanding, the Great Reset is something that was proposed by the Davos conference a couple of years ago, and so yes, it has some definition, and it probably is different from the Great Pause, if that was what we're going through now. <laughs> okay, so next question, down here, thank you. Uh, Thanks. Purse Harpen. I think you've been a bit unkind to uh, Jacinda and Grant. Uh, all politicians have to say things that people want to hear. And in the heat of battle in an election, some of the things they say are really quite stupid, such as saying that there won't be any more taxes. And yet, um, if you 
look at what happened with the budget responsibility rules, which were pure neoliberal neo things, restrictions that the Labour Party put on themselves to try and win an election, and they have just absolutely abandoned them when confronted with the COVID stuff. You know, they're now effectively printing money by selling bonds to the Reserve Bank, as almost every other country in the world is now doing. And they're doing that. Um, and at the same time, you have Grant and Adrian Orr publicly exchanging letters, which are bringing in a lot of comment about the way our financial system works. And I think they're creating a uh, constituency for making some pretty major changes long term. And that is what they have to do in, to um, join in the worldwide revolution against the stranglehold of the financial sector on the actual working and doing sector. And I, I think they're heading very strongly in the right direction. But don't expect them to say so until they're pretty close to doing it. Um, I, 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 I did talk about the, uh, the uh, debate that's going on, and it's included in such lefty, greeny papers as The Economist and The Financial Times, and this is a serious debate about the orthodoxy, which came through in the, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and uh, that fact that that debate's going on means that at some point the orthodoxy will be uh, departed from. Um, but I talked also about uh, Jacinda saying uh, quite early on in her term, first term, that the fiscal caution, and, and I could have added and do in the, in the text um, of the talk, um, the monetary uh, settings, monetary policy settings, which were basically developed in the late 1980s. Uh, she kept the conservative approach that Grant was adopting as a license to govern. And then I talked about the, she really needs to develop a license to govern from the coming generation. Um, I, I personally think that the, uh, the orthodoxies of the late 90s, late 80s, uh, as applied here, um, no longer really work. Uh, the, we've got people fighting the last war, basically, uh, fighting an inflationary war, and we've got a deflationary war. And it's like uh, the British generals in the Second World War thought they were going to be in the trenches, and and the American and the German tanks rolled over the top of them. So, the, the, I think uh, if I've understood what you were saying, uh, that is part of my argument that the uh, tax also, and I agree, um, at some point will need to be substantially changed in order to relate to current and future conditions. Okay, you with me? Yes, to pick up further on, on your comment, Colin, about expecting major change or for the need for that major change. You also mentioned that uh, you thought that the politicians were somewhat ambivalent, or you were ambivalent, where the politicians can meet the challenge. Um, do you have any thoughts as to who in society will provide leadership when it becomes increasingly obvious that it is needed? Do, do you want names? I, I Not names. No, no. no. I, well, that, that's why I looked, um, because I think the X, Y is don't have the mentality to make that change. And I may be wrong, I, I, I left open the possibility of a Damascene moment for, for the X, Ys, and that might come through necessity, that the changing world outside and the changing society inside will actually demand the sort of change that the X and Ys finally agree to. And I, I don't rule that out, I never say never in politics, but that's why I, um, I point towards Tamitha's generation, and we have to wait around a bit because they're not going to be a majority for a while. <laughs> but if I may add a question there, if you, if the response is so amorphous at the moment, is there any particular group or any particular line of thought that might provide leadership? Oh, you, oh, no, I, I think I know what you're asking. When, when um, back in the late, uh, well, the early 70s and through the 70s into the early 80s, when Keynesianism was fraying badly, 
there was Friedman sitting on the shelf. You could take Friedman off the shelf and uh, that was the answer. Uh, there isn't a Friedman sitting on the shelf right now uh, in the liberal democratic uh, uh, um, area of the world, but the Chinese will say, we've got it. You know, we've got state capitalism plus social surveillance and it's all sorted. I'd rather have something a bit different personally, but that is an interesting point and I did say that for 500 years or so, Europe and its offshoots, the United States, and ran the world in terms of A, they owned it because they overran it, but B, uh, d set the, base, set the uh, uh, arguments as to how societies and economies and nations should be run. Well, that is now no longer the case, and it's a con the, the ideas of how the world should go from here on um, are being contested in a way that they weren't even 20 years ago. So that it's not easy. There is no, as I say, there's no Friedman sitting on the shelf to take off and just say, oh, well, we'll do this instead. Okay. Uh, we've got a question okay. from the... Um, okay. So we I, have I, a let, let, let me say something else, and picking up on what Tamatha said before, um, wh one of the issues, if I go back to that, that set of ideas, um, particularly uh, since the 18th century, the Enlightenment has been... Uh, the driver of the ideas that have ran the, run the world. Uh, I think increasingly we're coming to understand, and, uh, and I don't want to overstate this, uh, that um, uh, uh, individualism is not the whole answer, and that something that we can learn from uh, animism uh, and the Māori way of thinking, uh, which is not particularly quite useful in our understanding of the world going on but I'm you know that I just throw that thought on the, on the floor yeah. okay we have a clarification and a question from someone else so as to the great pause it acknowledges COVID as an opportunity for reflection and to recognize the existing way of doing things is not fit for purpose it is equity focused whereas the great reset is potentially hijacked by vested interests Okay, so we also have a question for Tamitha. Uh, I like the idea of a workers' party, but I want to focus on what Tamitha said about localism and her reference to Tiaro Park. How does Tamitha think localism can help solve the housing crisis, especially when this Wellington City Council looks to be reducing its stock with effective sale of Arlington and the sale of 20 council housing units that was from Warwick Taylor. Okay, so the, lo the localism comment wasn't actually about Te Aro Park, that was about inequality. But, um, so the question was how localism is gonna respond to housing given that Wellington City Council's given up their, some of their housing stock, is that right? Oh yeah, okay, is that, is that? Uh, well, that, yeah, that was how it would be. Yeah, okay, <laughs> the question was. real rookie on what is a very complex issue, um, still getting my head around it, but my understanding is that there are some benefits from kainga order for the tenants for kainga order purchasing housing because they can access things like income related rent subsidies, um, which our tenants can't, but also we've got a huge bill in front of us in order to get all of our social housing stock up to standard, um, up to the healthy home standard by the deadline. And so this is just a theory. I'm not sure if this is the, the rationale behind it. Again, still wrapping my head around this, but I think there are some benefits for the tenants if we sell our housing. But I agreed that in an ideal world, the local government would have plenty bountiful up to standard social housing but it goes back to what i was saying is we just don't have the resources to be able to do that you know we get around 10 percent of national gdp you know and we're expected to do all of these things meanwhile the government has all of this, these resources and 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 decision making power to be able to allow tenants to do things like um accessing different forms of um social welfare um and so I think that's something that needs to be hashed out, but I think in an ideal world, local government would be would be administering again, yeah, plentiful and really good quality social housing, 
and also we would be able to help iwi to establish papakaiinga and other alternative forms of models and social uh, community housing um, so I think there's a whole bunch of levers that I think it would be great if we could pull, but I guess the reality of the situation we're in is that. Do we, have, do we, do we, do we have um, something to learn from the Māori notion of whānau, which is not family? Do you mean in, in, the, in the context of that, housing? That more, you use the word community, but uh, no, oh, not, not like just in terms of like community yeah, housing. Yeah, that we, we've narrowed the family down to a little unit. Nuclear family. And do we have something to learn? Oh, I think totally. It would be awesome if we could have, yeah, again, I guess that's like micro-localism to an extent is having little villages, which I suppose are neighbourhoods, but I guess because planning in New Zealand is such a new concept, all of our neighbourhoods haven't been laid out in the best way, so they don't really necessarily invite the concept of a village or a papakainga because, you know, in some places there isn't enough green space or community space, and some places are really poorly planned and you know, packed in and there's no potential for um, four communities getting together and meshing together really well. And I know that's just inviting questions about planning for growth, but all good that we can do that. Um, so, yeah, it's, I guess just that concept of, of, of a village is really important. Of a much, much wider grouping of people that stretches away out into the distance of these yeah, people. And, and, but also, <laughs> yeah, I guess the concept of everyone looking out for one another is really important too. Okay. Actually, one of the problems with this discussion is being able to hear, uh, and it's probably the sound system as well as age. Um, but I, I just wanted to comment that um, I feel, um, okay, Māori could contribute a lot in terms of our ideas, and one of them is respect for elders and uh, elders sort of standing up for what we've got to offer. Um, I mean, most of us can look back at an era before fridges. We can look back at a, an era where we carried a yellow card with our passport, noting all our vaccines. Um, uh, we've got... Uh, uh, um, well, well, uh, many of us lived before televisions were, were <laughs> around. You know, uh, we, we... Oh, we, we lived in an era where our parents were rather lucky if they went out of the country once in their lifetime, and if they came from an old country, they were lucky to go back once. Uh, there's a whole lot of ideas that were in our lifetimes that could do with coming back. Um, and just on local, um, I mean, I'd like to see more of us stand up um, for some old ideas. Um, for Shelley Bay, what's wrong with making them have self-composting toilets and uh, so they're not a drain on the, on the you know, community drain resources? Uh, um, I mean, an, another one's having a ferry to uh, Miramar. Um, everyone going to the airport can catch the damn ferry and, and going to Shelley Bay can go home that way as well, get a bike from the ferry at Miramar Wharf home. Um, anyway, I just um, salute you f for getting on Council, Tamatha, and, and hope you can stand up for some different ideas. But I feel also we should be counted as a generation on the other side um, of those that don't remember, don't care, don't have a vision for how life could be without some of what's now seen as mod cons. Thank you. Um, kia ora, Timothy and Colin. Thank you very much for your, for your talks. Um, my question is for you, Timothy, if you don't mind. Um, you spoke about the, the foundation of knowledge that Māori scholars have provided, like Moana Jackson is, is, is acting as a pathway forward um, for your mine-ish generation. Um, and you spoke about developing those processes and acting on them, and that was the next step. And I kind of wondered, you've touched on this a little bit, I think, but like, what's missing? Like, what are those, what, what do you need to turn that knowledge base into action and processes? What's missing for you guys? What, what, do you, what, are, what are the resources that you need? Um, I wish I could, no, I won't. I, I, I wish I could throw the mic over to my mate up there because he's, this is his domain, but anyway. Um, I don't think anything's stopping us and I, and I reckon we're doing everything that we can with the power that we have at this kind of level in our life, but like, um, this gentleman over here was saying, maybe it requires us to actually just 
um, give up our kind of way of life that we're currently accustomed to to actually throw it all in there for it. You know, and I think we're still, I still think we're, we're trying to figure out what that looks like, but I just know that, I know my generation will do what they need to do when they're called for it. And when Ihu Matau, when the call was put out last year for everyone to just drop everything and to go to the whenua, everyone I know did it. Like, absolutely everybody I know just dropped everything. They, um, they emailed their lecturers and said, can't come in for like the next month because I'm gonna be up at Ihu Matau. They called in their jobs, some quit their jobs that day. Um, so I think that the willingness to, to act when a legitimate call is put out for the progress of um, those concepts and, and way of doing and being that was created by those you know, legends, I think when that's put out, that my generation, but also everyone else that went to the whenua and that stands up for those issues, I think will do it. It's just waiting for, because again, I feel like we're on that cusp, so it's almost like waiting for that. I think there just has to be a call. And like you're saying, I don't think it's gonna be one person, but I don't know what that looks like. But in terms of what we need, I don't, I don't know. I reckon, like um, Mike's saying, we just have to keep collectivizing on every action that matters to us. And through that, we learn and we get the tools and every time we'll become more radical and we'll keep pushing it. Um, and we'll keep realizing that we don't, that none of us have to accept the way that things are. But I think that that takes like, repetitive actions and I'm afraid that it does seem, you know, that, it, that I get scared a lot and I lose sleep over being in fear that it's just, I guess, incremental radicalism and that we only do little bits at a time and that it never culminates in anything. But I guess we just have to keep trying and hope, you know, and being ready and hope that when that moment does come that we can actually rise to that. Yeah. And just quickly, Jim. we, uh, so who's next? Uh, but okay, first of all, we just have a comment from Deborah Williams in Christchurch. No one has mentioned global initiatives for world peace. New Zealand's 2020 budget was 88.8 per week for so called defence, plus 20 billion more for more military toys over the next decade. What do you foresee a change in spending this money? Do you see New Zealand not running off to international wars and spending that money on such things as housing, health, and education? Okay. Deborah Williams in Christchurch. Yep. And I've got one question over here and two over here, so we'll take sure. those and then we'll uh, wrap it up, I think. Uh, Jeff Bertram, get one. Uh, and then on the other side. Um, I want to have a little niggle at Colin's model of power. Um, <laughs> you have a model in which essentially the active agents in political life are generations. And so a fairly amorphous mass of people who have different political affiliations as voters have a shared identity as a, an age group. And somehow power moves from generation to generation without locating exactly which agents in each generation are the movers and the shakers. And I'm coming at this from a different point of view. If you think of the state as the committee of the bourgeoisie, each generation has its class structure, its distribution of income and power within itself, and its active bits and pieces. And in many ways, I'm more interested in what happens with the generational turnover within the corporate business elite, which has far more power over what government does than your general population. Um, th than I am in thinking about, you know, just what those people born in a particular era um, may think and want. Now, and I guess what I'm saying is, I think Colin is this overestimating the power of the democratic process and underestimating the uh, importance of class uh, in your analysis of power. Okay, can I take those other two questions so that we'll just get them all on the table? So there's the distributions of power, the issues of peace, and two more. <laughs> and then we'll have solved the world's problems. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. It's very helpful. I, I'm going to go back to age cohorts because I, I think it's uh, very important what you've said, Colin. I think it's a fact that the only age cohort that's going to increase in the next 20 years to the 200-year anniversary 
will be those over 65. <coughs> um, and our history is one of fighting for one person, one vote. <coughs> and I'm wondering if those over 65 are willing to give up their vote to accelerate the process because I accept the urgency. <coughs> uh, I, I, I think no, um, but if, if I can pick... Okay. Um, first, Colin, if, uh, if you could make a comment. You mentioned about maybe Jacinda, um, about maybe losing uh, power or getting re-elected when you mentioned 40% uh, housing bubble. If you could explain more of that or was that, was that a joke? And, and my uh, other question is that... Um, Tabitha and um, Colin, you mentioned too, and I think Jeff did, about the, the bureaucrats a little bit within the, the city council, and also we, we see that in the public service. How can that change, and how do you think that the, the young generation are more coming into those positions to influence and change the old guard? Okay. okay. Uh, I'll, I'll pick up my bits first and then Tamitha yeah, yeah. can come in. But um, what I suggested to chief executives of uh, government departments in 2017 that they should each set up a small group. It would be an informal group which met on Thursdays every fortnight and had a drink and developed questions. And they weren't going to tell chief executives what to do, but they'd be constantly questioning them. That's just one thought. Um, the second point was the house price. No, it's not, not a joke. You cannot have uh, asset prices go, becoming further and further divorced from uh, affordability, rationality. At some point it stops. A and in the old days it used to be sorted by uh, a thumping good inflation and so the house prices didn't fall but they fell in real terms and I think there's a real prospect of that. And in fact the Reserve Bank last year in its... In its um, uh, a financial pressure report, I've forgotten exactly what they call it, uh, did talk, did say, did test banks against a 37.5% uh, house price fall as a possibility. Um, the question up the back, which I was going to come off the back of, and I've now forgotten what it was I was going to... About the... Oh, yes. The um, no, no. Uh, we're, we're, yes, the, the answer is no. The 65s weren't... The, uh, I don't uh, yeah, yeah, there is, um, and it, it remains. Uh, and the baby boomers, etc., and then are, gonna, are around for a good while yet, uh, and and will vote. And the X Ys will be around for even longer, of course. Um, and to pick up Jeff's point, yes, of course there are dif differences and divisions within generations, and and there are activists, and there are, uh, are fellow travellers, and there are people, uh, for instance, of the that uh, generation I've talked about, the cohort I've talked about of 42 to 61 who really changed the way business was done at New Zealand. And they were business people and they put on suits and everything, but they certainly had different values from their parents in terms of our businesses should run. Uh, and yes, each has got a hierarchy. And what have we finished up with? We finished up with what I call an educational elitocracy uh, out of coming off the back of being the first generation that could all go to university and we finished and then our children did and then our grandchildren did and so we've got this marvelous elite of which we're part uh, etc and so yes of course there are um, class and other divisions within each cohort but I'll now pass to Tamitha having right, talked too long. Last word to Tamitha. Yes. Solve, it. Solve it all Tamitha. Um, <laughs> yes. Oh, so I guess about the, the bureaucrats, yeah, that's something that I've really been grappling with and I thought naively before coming into this role that if you had the right people in positions of power that you could get the change you needed, but it turns out that there's like a million barriers to that, that are people that can't be held accountable and can't be voted out. So I think that's, 
something that I'm still grappling with and I'm not sure how you solve that, but I wonder whether it has something to do with constitutional transformation because from my perspective, more in terms of central government, but I feel like the policy and the legislation that they create are expressions of the system. And so rather than expecting for every, to have the right politician in there that's able to, I guess, have that academic or intellectual heft that can look through the intricacies of, of that legislation and how it is to be applied, somehow we have to be able to hold, I feel, I feel like somehow you have to be able to hold senior bureaucrats to account as well, but I don't know how that happens, but I feel like Ashley Bloomfield's world has been helpful in the sense that he's put a human face to it, and I wonder whether that's piqued people's curiosity about who's leading all of the other ministries and if they're actually people that are passionate like him about health and have these innovative ways of thinking or whether they're just hopping around ministry jobs and hopping around all these senior bureaucrat roles. So I'm not sure what that looks like, but I feel like the way that we impact that, um, you know, hold the old guard to account, as you said, is, um, is using the platform that we have as, as leaders, for me as a politician, but but for my generation and their capacity as leaders to talk about it and actually ask people, especially people of our generation, to question the system and what kind of outputs it has automatically and um, whether the systems that we have in place and the mechanisms throughout it are enough to protect people's dignity and integrity and to protect pe the planet and its finite um, existence. So, that, but that's definitely the challenge there because I've, I see that as the biggest barrier to any fundamental change for any of those issues that we've talked about today. So yeah, sorry, that's not okay. a very positive um, note to end on. All right, well, that's, that um, brings us to a close and I, I'd just like to say a word on behalf of the pre-1942 generation. Um, <laughs> I think that, uh, and, and speak to the 65s, um, because I think we are right in the middle of the start of one crisis, uh, and it has already wrought uh, significant change uh, in the way things are done, if not the way things are thought about necessarily. Um, and I must say, I'm a bit anticipating what Colin did uh, write about in his paper, that there's more to come, <laughs> and uh, on the lines of the sorts of things Peirce has talked about, the financial bubble that's blowing up in the United States and here to some extent, uh, coupled with the uh, massive rise in um, unemployment, poverty, hunger, and all the rest of it in the shining light on the hill is, is not going to uh, solve itself uh, easily in my opinion. Um, but I must say I'm delighted to Colin, to th I wish to thank Colin for coming up with this idea and making us think forward uh, and also uh, delighted to Tamitha for coming and responding because if there's hope for the future, it's in people like you. So, na mihi nui, Tamitha, and thank you very much, Colin, and thank you all for coming and have a happy and safe Christmas.